Tonight we have uh, Alex De Robertis calling in all the way from Seattle. He is with the NOAA Fisheries, and I'm just going to, because there's some Seattle people, I want to get this correct, <laughs> with NOAA Fisheries at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center in Seattle. He works in the Resource Assessment and Conservation Engineering Division program group, and that is maybe familiar because the acronym is Race Division, and of course, Lyle Britt, he's been here plenty of times, and Jeff Knapp and, and um, Dwayne Stevenson and others have been here, and so Race Division is somewhat very, actually very familiar to the, the region and this audience um, for the work they've been doing on the Northern Bering Sea Bottom Trawl Survey, but Alex is not only Race Division, he is in the Midwater and Conservation Engineering Program. So that's, uh, that's a lot for, the, for us up here. And um, with that, Alex kind of saved the day. Now the, the pandemic has come and it, Nome really noticed a lack of ships into the port of Nome. And of course, certainly a lack of research vessels and research activity in the area. We felt that. And um, you were able to have the little drones that could, I think was really the story. It reminds me of sort of the childhood story that the, um, the little engine that could. So out of nowhere, very in Bering Strait fashion, you were able to gin up something to save the day, uh, kind of um, pulled it off. And so tonight, with no further ado, let's hear how you were able to save the day during this most unusual year when, uh, for all of us, we felt the lack of research. Okay, thank you, Gay. Um, and, and thank you for organizing this and for inviting me, and, and thanks to all of you. Uh, for spending your uh, Thursday uh, Thursday evening um, listening to me. Um, so let me figure out how to share a screen here and get my presentation started. Just take one second. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Okay, very well. And can everybody hear me? I guess you can hear me, right? Okay, okay great. So uh, my name is Alex D. Robertus. Uh, I, I work at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center in Seattle. Um, and, and Gabe pretty much introduced my, my first slide here. Essentially, what we tried to do is, uh, as the pandemic developed, we realized that it was going to become difficult um, to do ship-based surveys um, in, in the Bering Sea. And so we tried to take some of what we'd been doing in the last few years, doing research uh, using drones, like the one seen on these uh, images here, um, we've been working with them for the last uh, five years or so and, and sort of thought, well, you know, we could probably do something to try and help fill in gaps in, uh, in survey coverage. So we put together a project um, to try and do that. And, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. And, um, you know, one thing I want to sort of say at the get go is that I'm here speaking to you, but there were a lot of people involved in, in this work. And uh, their, their list of names there's, is here, the people who work directly on this project, but also over the last five years, there's a long list of people, um, all of whom who sort of made this possible. So it's really a, a, a group effort. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is walleye pollock. Um, they're a really common uh, species that's a gadded sort of cod-like fish. Um, they're really abundant in the Bering Sea in particular. Um, they're the second largest fishery in the world. Um, they're very roughly, don't realize, it's those of you in the media shouldn't quote me on this number, but it's roughly 5% of uh, global fish catch. It varies depending on what, what's happening in, in that, this, this and other fisheries. But so it's a huge fishery. Um, it's by far the biggest U.S. fishery by weight. Um, the fisher yep, Alex, go I'm just going to interrupt. It's in the southern Bering Sea. It's not in our northern Bering Sea. Uh, that that's correct? correct. So the fishery, I can show a graph of where it is uh, later. Thank you for okay. that. Yes, it's mostly the eastern Bering Sea shelf, and and most of the fishery occurs kind of in deeper water. So sort of out towards um, the shelf break, and sort of, you know, maybe three hundred feet of water and and deeper. So it's sort of not in your backyard, but sort of in your neighborhood. I would, uh, you know, I would say. Um, but it's a big uh, fishery. Um, it's really economically important. Um, the, just the wholesale value of the, of the pollock fishery is more than you know, 1.3 or $4 billion uh, per year. It supports a lot of jobs in, in Alaska. A lot of the fishing is out of Dutch Harbor, for example. Um, I have some images uh, here. These are what pollock look like. 
over here. I think you guys can see my mouse. Let me see if I can uh, turn it into a little dot. So it's easy to see. Yeah, there we go. Um, so these are Pollock. They're about two feet long or so. Um, there's a really great book. If anybody wants to learn more about Pollock and the Pollock fishery, there's a book that was written by a colleague of ours named Kevin Bailey. It's called Billion Dollar Fish, and it's all about the fishery and the development. Um, really great. So if you're more interested in this, you should definitely uh, look this book up. Um, great sort of winter read. Um, so here's, an, here's just a photo of what happens with Pollock. You know, they wind up um, sort of processed and sold, you know, in supermarkets around the world. Uh, and this um, image here I thought was kind of fun, I found today. Uh, it's, a, it's a picture of a filet of fish from, um, so it's a fish sandwich from um, McDonald's. Um, you know, written on it, it says the Bering Sea sends its regards, you know, wild caught Alaskan Pollock. So this is probably, you know, what a lot of Americans think of the Bering Sea, I guess. Um, and the other interesting thing here is that there's, a, there, there's this little symbol here and, and essentially it shows that it's a, it's a certified sustainable seafood by MSC. And essentially uh, what that means, it's a, sort of a stamp of approval of, of good management. Um, you know, that, that essentially it's sort of a guilt. Uh, you should not feel bad about, about eating Pollock because it's a well-managed fishery. So let, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, there's three major parts uh, that are used to, to manage the Bering Sea uh, Pollock stock and to set fishing quotas. Uh, there's the bottom trawl survey, which many of you are familiar with. I think Lyle is here and Lyle has, has, has presented uh, in, in this forum before. Um, essentially where they go out and do uh, trawl hauls on the bottom um, in each of these little squares and then and then sum it up so they can estimate the, how many Pollock there are in the Bering Sea. Um, more recently, they've been coming up into the northern Bering Sea, as, as you likely know. Um, uh, there's also a second kind of survey. It's called an acoustic trawl survey. And there we basically use sonar or sound. We bounce sound off uh, fish bags and also use trawling. I'll talk about that a little more later. And that's done every other year. And that's done uh, on uh, the Oscar Dyson, which is a, a, a dedicated NOAA ship. Uh, the third sort of piece of information that's used is uh, information from the fishing trawlers uh, themselves. They have fishery observers um, who keep track of the catches, of the size of the fish, their age, kind of that kind of stuff. So, so these three pieces of information are combined together um, in population models in a stock assessment. And then those are used um, to set uh, the fishing quotas uh, essentially through a, through a council process. Um, the North uh, Pacific uh, Management Council does that. And they have an annual process and you set the quota uh, every year. Is there a question? I heard somebody. No, nope, I'll just keep going. No question. I think someone just came off mute. Take yeah, care. Yeah, sure. No problem. Um, so we talked about this a little a little earlier. Um, you know, sort of in in the in the late spring. You know, the thing that happened to really all of us in in 2020 is that COVID happened. Um, things you know got complicated. It became very difficult uh, to do surveys. Things looked pretty wobbly by let's say about April. Um, there was uh, concerns about sort of health and safety, health and safety of the uh, on the ships, um, for on the communities for which people would come in and out of. And in the end, there was, there was sort of became difficult. But essentially, the choice that was made was to cancel uh, many uh, uh, research surveys, both in Alaska and and uh, nationwide. And and so uh, it turns out that both the uh, bottom trawl survey and the acoustic survey uh, for Pollock. So the sort of two of the three legs of that stool that I, I described earlier, the bottom trawl survey, the acoustic survey, and the, uh, and, and the fisheries uh, observers. That was still done, but there weren't going to be any surveys. And those are really important um, for setting fish quotas. If you don't have good information on how many fish there are, um, it proves difficult to, uh, to set catch limits in a reasonable way. So. Uh, essentially, what we tried to do is try to use these ocean going drones that we've been working with to try and fill in some information gaps in in these uh, in, in the acoustic survey. So it's sort of the basic idea was, well, uh, we've been working with these. We've been instrumenting them uh, with sonar and um, 
comparing them to uh, what we get with research vessels. So why don't we try and do a survey uh, with them? And, and this is just an image of what these things look like. These are the three uh, vehicles that we used. Um, they're essentially sailboats. They're about 20 feet long. They have this wing on them. It looks like an airplane wing, essentially, and that's the sail. And uh, that spins around and, they, and it uses that for propulsion. Um, it also has some solar panels, which you can see here, which it uses to generate electricity to keep its computers uh, going. It basically has like a couple of cell phone uh, computers running on that, that are the brains of the operation. And uh, down here, there's a keel. And if you look carefully, you can kind of see there's this sort of torpedo looking thing. And that actually has our uh, sonar instruments on it. Um, we've been uh, working with the company that, that developed these. Um, and, and with a series of partners, including some um, sonar manufacturers and, and engineering groups to, to basically try and fit uh, the sonar measurements that we uh, do on, on these vehicles. They're really, it sort of is a good uh, sort of marriage because the, the, the vehicles are really good for, they can drive around, they know where to go, it all sort of works, um, but they're at the surface. And so you can't really see into the ocean and that's what um, using sound uh, lets you do. So when I talk about this to people, and I've, I've done this a couple times, um, sort of people say, you did what? Huh? You know, I don't know anything about this. You know, how, how can you do this? What, how, how's this all going to go? And, um, and so, you know, when I, I've thought about this and I gave a talk to the fishing industry about this and, and, and sort of what I sort of realized is, you know, kind of tried to put myself in their perspective. And, and I, I like this image here of uh, Dorothy and friends from the Wizard of Oz kind of looking behind the curtain and, uh, and, and seeing the Wizard of Oz and, and you know, it wasn't, it wasn't all quite what it was cracked up to be. So what I'm really gonna try and do in this talk is sort of let you look behind the curtain and kind of make your, make your own decision, but hopefully I'll do a little better than, than the Wizard of Oz. So let's, let's just step back for a minute and, and you know, think a little bit about how sonar works. You have to have just a sort of very basic understanding of this to try to understand the rest of this talk. And I think most of you are familiar with this but um, it's, it's worth just spending a couple minutes on it. So I, mean, I made a little cartoon um, and just imagine here's a boat, here's a fish, here's the seafloor. And so if you're on this boat here and you send a pulse of sound out, that pulse will travel down into the water. It'll hit the fish. And then when it hits a fish, it'll just start, it'll come back, right? It'll just be an echo. And uh, you can then measure that um, back on the ship. And it turns out that uh, water is really transparent to sound. It's not transparent to light. You can't see very deep, but you can. Uh, but it, sound essentially penetrates through the water, and uh, you can see, uh, you know, very far. And and that's essentially the basis for how uh, how sonar surveys work. Um, if you take a bunch of these pings, you can actually just uh, just put them together. So this is just a, a every ping is the strength of the echo is a is a different color. So uh, white is weak, red is really strong. Um, this way is time and this way is depth. And so what you see here is this really strong echo here at about 110 meters. That's the bottom of the ocean. Um, down here, you see these things above the bottom in the water and these are all fish, these are all pollock. And the stuff above it is kind of this layer of fuzz which is plankton, um, jellyfish, um, some small fish that aren't really big Pollock. We don't really know exactly what that is, but basically, when we do our Pollock surveys, we drive around, uh, we count up all these echoes, and that tells us roughly how many uh, fish there are. And so that's essentially what we try to do uh, with these drones. So uh, the other thing we do uh, when we do these fish surveys is we do uh, occasional trawls. Essentially, what we do is we take these acoustic measurements that we make, and and from the acoustic measurements, you essentially get the amount. So you sort of get how much, uh, how much of that sound is reflected, or I'll use the word backscatter, but essentially all it means is reflections. So uh, you can basically add up all the reflections, but you don't know what species they are, and you don't know how big they are. And, and it's, uh, we can't really do that uh, from just the sound signature itself. We're sort of trying to do that and trying to learn how to do that better, but, but it's just not really that uh, reliable at this point. So what we do is we come in with a trawl, and we find a place where there's an aggregation of fish. We catch the fish, we bring them up, like you see here in this little image. Um, and then we count and measure them, just like they do on the bottom trawl surveys. And um, 
from that, we get the species compositions, the size of the fish, the, you know, how, how much they weigh for their length. And also we cut their little ear bones out and they have little rings in them like, like trees essentially. And um, you can then age them from that. Um, they lay a, a little ring, it's just like trees. So you can then put this all together in a survey and, and get the abundance. And that's sort of typically what we do uh, on the ships on our, on our normal survey. So the idea was, well, you know, we can't do all of this on a, uh, on a drone, but maybe we can do it, you know, enough uh, to make it uh, useful. So, so let's talk about the drones just a, a little bit. Um, uh, we've been working with this company called Sail Drone. Uh, it's a company that has developed uh, these drones. It's a really sort of interesting company. It's sort of half uh, software company, half boat shop. Um, they're down in Alameda, uh, California, so they're sort of one of these um, one of these sort of uh, San Francisco uh, startup, you know, high tech uh, companies uh, started by a really uh, interesting guy named Richard Jenkins. I'll show you a photo of him later. Um, he actually set the, this technology was developed. He built this um, basically a go kart with a sail on it, and he set the land speed record for uh, for for basically a, what they call land yachts. It's basically a sailboat with wheels that they uh, sail around. I, I can't remember how fast he went, but it was ridiculously fast. And he spent 10 years doing that and developed this, this wing and then started building these uh, boats. Um, so they're wind and solar powered robots. They use wind for propulsion, um, solar power for electricity. Uh, you control them over a satellite link. And, and the way that basically works is you pre-program them, you tell them what to do, and then they check in every 15 minutes or so, and they send a little update. And at that time, uh, you, can also, you can also connect to them and tell them to do something else, uh, you know, and just update their instructions. Um, so they have a, a fish finder or a sonar uh, that, we, that we use in our surveys. These are essentially the same thing as you would have on your boat to measure depth and, and find fish. Um, some of you are likely familiar with that. It also has a bunch of scientific sensors uh, to measure properties of the air and the water. So sort of oceanographic meteorological sensors like wind and uh, temperature and salinity and, um, and, and things like that. Um, importantly for all this, and, and the point of the, of, of the sort of project that we had here is that we'd sort of developed the methods for how to make this all work, how to put these sonars on it, how to process the data, uh, you know, what the, what the sort of pitfalls are, how, sort of how to be able to do this reliably for long periods of time, because we've been working on this uh, since 2015. So it really wasn't a re research project. This is really a sort of application. We'd sort of worked that all out. There's a science paper for people who are, you know, scientific paper for people that are into that that talks about the sort of details of that. And, and perhaps the most sort of interesting thing in some ways is that we did a, a during a Pollock survey in the past, um, we actually, had the boat follow the sail drone around and we could compare uh, what they both saw. And essentially what we found is that in terms of amount of pollock that they detect, um, it's essentially the same. Um, so the, the sail drone and the ship actually detected the same amount of pollock, but interestingly actually the pollock detected by the, uh, by the drone were shallower because the fish are actually diving when the ship comes over them. But it didn't make a difference in terms of how many. So we knew that this could sort of make reliable measurements and of, uh, of Pollock that are equivalent to what we see on, on the ship. And that, that was really key. So that was all already done and, and, and sort of the reason that, that this was, we could even attempt to do. Okay, so I have a little video and I think videos are probably the best. I might have to change my cursor here. Uh, there we go. Uh, hang on, let me see if I can do this another way. I wasn't anticipating that, but I think we can get around. Okay, here's a here's a little video, um, and and the and the video basically is just going to show this vehicle uh, driving around, and then it'll be underwater. I, I some underwater footage that I want to point out, but this is basically what it looks like. Um, for those of you that think it's more interesting, here in the back, uh, you'll be able to see a, uh, a somebody kiteboarding. This is out in San Francisco, uh, right near where the company is based. Um, so there it is, kind of moving along. It's about 20 feet long, has an 18 foot sail. This is an older one that has these outriggers on it. Doesn't, the ones we use don't have those. 
So there it is kind of scooting along. Here's Here they are being deployed in Dutch Harbor during one of our previous uh, missions. You can see he's actually, this is Richard, and he's actually controlling it with his cell phone. Here it is scooting along in a little bit of wind. That's essentially uh, what they look like. And they're just uh, little robots. Here's what the, this is the underwater uh, part of it. There's a sensor here to measure ocean properties. Down here at the bottom is, is where our transducer is. That's essentially the microphone that listens for the sound and transmits the sound. So this is sort of where, this, where the sonar uh, bit is. You can see it underwater. Um, here it is again. And this actually shows, uh, this little cowling is removed. And this actually shows a sort of complicated little thing here. And what this is, is actually a hinge uh, that we used to uh, that basically allows the uh, sailboat to move, but keeps the transducer pointed down, which was one of the issues that we had uh, to sort of deal with uh, to get this all to work. So I just thought a little video would be fun to see. And then we'll get back to where we were. Um, let's see, I think I lost my place. Here we go. Okay, we're back. Okay, so. So here, this is basically our plan. In, in, in some ways, this is really simple. Um, the pandemic was, was sort of happening. Um, we weren't able to travel. We weren't, now typically what happens is with these vehicles, um, when we've used them up in Alaska, is we, um, we transport them to Dutch Harbor by a freighter. We put the stuff in a, uh, put the vehicle in a uh, shipping container, ship it up and, and then release it there. That's what you saw uh, in the video. Uh, they actually had to sail to and from Alaska. That took about 45 days or so. Um, these things move at about, on average, about two knots. That's roughly walking pace. So, you know, it took 45 days to, to sail up there. Um, they go faster than that, but that's sort of the average over a long period of time. Um, we used three sail drones. Um, we, we did the, we surveyed the Bering Sea Shelf. This is the area that we typically uh, surveyed during the survey at 40 mile spacing. I'll talk about this a little more, but that's um, a little bit wider spacing because that's how much time we had. Um, we did the survey uh, essentially starting on the 4th of July up until August. And if you look down here, here's just a little graph that shows uh, the timing of these surveys. So when we did them for every year. So for example, in 2000, we went from mid June until sort of the, till towards the end of July. Um, you know, more recently it's sort of taken longer. Um, and this red one is what we did in 2020. And so roughly we were at the same, we did this at the same time. And that's really important because fish migrate and move around. And so you really have to sort of get those one of the things that we had to get right was make sure we could get the timing right. And we sort of had a late start and a long trip. So that um, it was kind of this, it was kind of a, a, a sort of hustle uh, that we had to do. And, and actually this whole project, really probably the hardest part of this was just like the, the time constraints. Everything sort of happened um, very quickly. And, and that was probably the most uh, sort of challenging thing in, in, in the end. Um, at night, these vehicles stop. We don't survey at night. The, the pollock come off bottom and migrate up into that layer of, of green fuzz that you saw earlier and it's hard to pick them out. And that's what the survey does too, so we just stop. And, and the other thing is they're small boats um, and when the weather gets really bad, um, things kind of fall apart. You can't, the, the boats themselves do fine, but the uh, sonar images get, uh, get sort of messed up by bubbles that get swept in um, from the wind. And so we just stopped in the few days that, that the weather was bad and in the summer, it's, it's not too bad. So when the, when the winds blew more than 25 knots, we just sat in place and, and waited, which is what we do with ships, um, usually at, at higher wind speed. So this is a uh, this is just to give you an idea of kind of what you see when you're when you're doing this. This is actually a screen grab of what we saw while we were doing the uh, the uh, survey. Uh, what you see here is these little dots. It kind of looks like a video game. These little dots here are the drones. The drones had split up and they're each doing a sector of the of the Bering Sea. Over here, you can see a photo. It takes pictures every once in a while and you can see what's happening. So you get a kind of drone's eye view. These are coming in over the satellite. Um, here is a, you have a bunch of instruments and you can see readouts of them. This is just the wind speed, which is important for a sailboat. Um, and down here, you can see the sort of little pixely thing, which is kind of hard to see, but essentially that's a sort of low resolution summary 
of the uh, of the acoustic data. And, and you know, if you're somebody like me who spends a lot of time looking at these things, you can sort of make make sense out of this um, for you know. And and uh, you know, it's sort of a, a, a sort of I grew up playing Atari as a kid in the '80s, and so it's sort of an Atari version of the um, of the. Uh, of, of, the, of the acoustic data, but it's enough to know that things are working and, and have a rough idea of, uh, of what's happening. So that's kind of how it works. You go to a website and you basically tell it where you want to go. And, and then, and then um, the people in Alameda that are running this essentially program this into the, into the drone. So it's all done over the internet. Okay, so, so let's talk a little bit about our, our survey design and kind of what we tried to do. Uh, in 2020, we, I said, we, as I mentioned earlier, we kind of did, we didn't have a lot of time um, because we had gotten a late start. And so um, we decided to do essentially what was a contingency plan for the dice. And we had been sort of thinking about, well, what are we going to do if, if, the, if, there's, if, the, if the surveys happen, but they are uh, just, we don't have as much time to do them because we get a late start. So we had come up with, well, our plan is to do this. We're going to basically, this is our normal survey, 20 miles spaced. There's 30 or so transects, um, you know, in the Bering Sea, we're basically just like mowing the lawn with a lawnmower. Um, and we decided, well, we'll just do half the spacing if we, if we have half the time. And um, that's essentially what we did with these three sail drones. Each sail drone covered a uh, sector of the Bering, of the Bering Sea. Um, so, and then this isn't all the whole Bering Sea. It's just the outer shelf where the, um, where pollock are, are most abundant. Um, so, so there was essentially one that did the green lines, one that did the, uh, the pink and one that did the, the blue, they split up. So the important thing here is it's essentially less sampling than, uh, than, than in a typical year. And, and we'll get back to that. Alex, Alex, yep. this is Gay. Is this area, this, this shaded red area and, and the other area where you've got your drones, is that really where the Pollock fishery for us that are kind of- Yes, yes. So that's where it comes pretty close to within maybe 200 miles or 150 miles of St. Lawrence Island. Yeah, I mean, I can show a, um, I, at the end of this, I'm not going to show it as part of this talk, but maybe at the end, if there's interest, I can show an image of where the fishery actually is. Um, okay. This is, Thank the you. fishery tends, tends to be kind of out here and, and, and here kind of close to Dutch Harbor, this kind of, but, but um, yeah, I can show an image of actually where the fishery actually, actually happened, but it's mostly kind of, you know, out here on the shelf break and, and, and over here. So we kind of okay. cover a wider area, but most of the fishing is kind of in those areas. Does that help? Thank yep, thank you. Okay, so, so basically what we did with the drones was what we would have done with the ship, except we couldn't. So, okay, so back to the, uh, the sort of Wizard of Oz thing. Okay, let's um, sort of be realistic and, and think about sort of what the limitations are. You know, this isn't a ship, can't do all the things that you want to do on a ship. Um, you know, it's, it's limited. And, and so one has to think about, you know, how exactly can we do something that's that's useful. Um, so I, I have kind of this is really what the rest of the talk is about, um, and these are the issues that we had to deal with. And I just want to try and talk a little bit about how we dealt with with each one. This is kind of the look behind the curtain and, and have it sort of make try and make sense. Um, the, one of the major things is there's no trawling. So um, trawling is really important um, for these surveys. It's what we use to verify which species. Um, how big the fish are and, you know, and how old they are. And that's important um, for the stock assessments. Um, the, the other uh, limitation that's really important is that the sonar that we use uh, measures fish backscatter. So it measures echo. By backscatter, I mean just uh, sound that's reflected back in towards the, towards the sonar. Um, and so, but what you really want to know is fish biomass or weight. That's uh, what that's really what you use to set uh, fishing quotas. So you have to do some kind of conversion, and typically uh, we use the trawl information to do that, and we didn't have that. Um, there are also there's also this thing called the acoustic dead zone, which is you can't actually detect fish that are really near the seafloor uh, because the uh, bottom echo is really big and essentially it gets hidden. Uh, the the fish the weak fish echoes get hidden. I'll talk about that, but. Uh, there was a difference in the equipment we use. The ships use uh, big transducers, so big sonars, which actually have small, uh, have thin sort of pencil-like beams. And the beams we used on the sail drones are wider because they carry smaller uh, transducers. So basically, there's an issue where you can't detect the fish very near the bottom quite as well. And, and so we'll talk about that. 
And also this issue that, that we talked about um, of 40 mile spacing instead of 20 miles, which is what we, what we normally do. And, and how do you sort of account for that? So we'll just try and hit these, these four points. Okay, so, so the first issue is, is really related to, you know, no trawling, how do you know what species you're looking at? And, and that's a real important question. Um, I think the, the real answer to that is sort of it, in this part of the Bering Sea, it's an easy problem. And, and the reason for that is that um, the midwater fish are just dominated by pollock. It's, a, it's one of the cleanest fisheries in the world, it turns out. And, and when we do surveys, um, this just shows the fraction of the fish catch uh, by weight. I've excluded the jellyfish because they're actually very poor sound reflectors. So they're basically acoustically invisible almost. Um, so, uh, so, and this is year. And so what you can see here is that, you know, this number is very high. The average is 98%. So basically 98% of the, of the sonar reflections that come from fish are, um, are from pollen. So basically if you can measure reflections from fish, you, you basically, it's all pollen, you know, almost. Um, and, and then this is uh, just shows uh, the fraction of weight in the pollock fishery that's actually pollock. And you can see again, uh, the average is you know, almost 99%. And, uh, and this does include jellyfish. I think that's the next most common one. And then most importantly, right here, um, this is 2020. So we do have some information from the fishery. And so we know that 2020 wasn't weird. I mean, they basically you know, were fishing for pollock and that's essentially you know, the almost, you know, and they caught a lot of pollock. You know, there is a bycatch in the pollock fishery, but it's very small amounts. People compare, you know, tons versus tons of pollock versus, you know, one salmon um, in, in the catch. So, uh, so essentially we know what we're looking at. It's pollock and not because, you know, we, we're good at, at, at interpreting sound. It's just, that's all there is. So it's, it's not a hard problem. And, and this is really important to so sort of understanding the environment that you're in for this kind of work is, is really important. And we have you know, many years of, of information and that's really what allows us to do this. This wouldn't work in the equator or someplace where there's many species. Um, and so, so the next issue is, well, so these sonars, they measure backscatter, you know, they measure echoes and they don't, and they don't measure biomass. Um, and it turns out that the two are, are very related. Um, what we did is we dug back into our, our previous surveys and came up with this graph. Um, essentially, what you see here um, in red here is the biomass from the acoustic survey. So this is the final result after you take the trawl information and the sonar information and calculate everything. Um, and, and, what we, and what I've done here is I've just averaged it down so the units don't matter, but the average over this from 1994 to, to 2018 is one. And I've done that so you can essentially on the same scale, look at the backscatter or the, uh, or the sonar measurements. This is just sonar measurements, nothing else um, and from, from the survey. So we essentially took the survey and pretended all we had was sonar measurements. And what you can see here is these two things, these two curves, you know, basically track each other really well. So, it, so what that says is if you know the amount of echoes, then you also have a pretty, can get a pretty good idea of, uh, of what the survey biomass is going to be. And that's essentially uh, what we've done here in this uh, slide here. We're showing the same information in a different way. This is just backscatter on, on this axis here. This is a uh, pollock biomass in millions of tons. So a million tons is a lot of fish, it turns out. Um, and the, each dot here is a survey. So it's just, you know, in one you know, in one particular year, this is this is how much backscatter we saw, and this is how much uh, biomass was estimated at the end. Uh, this, the line here with it's shown in black, is uh, is the average. And essentially, what we did is we used the average. So it's just a lookup. So if we measure this much backscatter, we can just find whatever point that is on this line and and convert it um, to biomass by just basically drawing out this way. It's just a linear regression. It's a very simple. Uh, Method. And this R squared equals 0 0.95 is just a bunch of gibberish here. But what it means is that the backscatter ex explains 95% of the variation. So, so if you know backscatter, you basically know uh, the biomass to a great degree. I mean, it's not completely accurate, but it's pretty close. You're kind of not, you can think of it as you're 95% of the way there. So, so pretty good. 
you know, and, and, and we didn't really know how well this would work. So part of this project, while these drones are out of sea, is we were trying to figure all this stuff out. And, and it actually turned out to be like a very simple solution to a, to a complicated problem. So, so this worked out really well. We were very pleased with this. Um, this graph here is a, is a similar graph. It's going to take me a minute to explain, but, it, but it's important. Um, what's shown here in, in red is just is the survey by mass. So this is just what the survey saw. Okay, and then what we did for each year that's shown in grades, let's just pick one year. Let's pick 1996. What we did is we said, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take in 1996, we're gonna pretend we didn't have any trawl information, just forget the trawl information. And then we're gonna go and we're gonna basically uh, do this whole thing again, but without 1996. So, and then say, okay, let's do a conversion based on that. And then you get this, um, you get this this dot here and we did that every year so the, the important point to get across is this is basically a way to try and simulate what we did in 2020 we're essentially figuring out how well could we do in estimating our our biomass um, if we didn't have trawl information and again you can see these track pretty well and here's some simple statistics on it the average difference is about six percent and the min the minimum is almost you know dead on and the maximum is about 11%. So we sort of think we should be, you know, within less than 10, within 10% without any trawl information on the, if we're trying to estimate the total biomass. And, and so that's, you know, we felt really good about that. That's, that's a pretty uh, good estimate uh, given that, and we have a fair amount of confidence in this, um, given that we're missing sort of half of the, of, of the survey. So given that we thought, well, this, all, this whole drone thing is, is gonna work uh, pretty well. Um, we sort of knew, we had an impression that this was going to be this way, but we started this project essentially before um, we had gotten, kind of gotten all the way through just because we didn't have time. So uh, this part's sort of more for the people that, that really like acoustics like me, but it actually was an important issue and something that the fishing industry was, was sort of interested in, in, in knowing more about. Um, the, the sort of concern here, uh, again, is that, is that the... Uh, is that the drone has a wider beam than the ship. And I've sort of exaggerated it here so you can see what, what I mean. Essentially, the issue is this, is that the, the beam is a cone. And the front of the cone that hits the seafloor is like an arc. It's not a straight line, but it's like an arc. And once it touches the seafloor, the, the echo from the seafloor is huge compared to the fish, and it just drowns them out. So um, essentially, the, the problem you're left with is you wind up with a little bit of a little, a little sort of triangled wedge on either side of the sonar beam where you can't detect fish. So in this case, you would see this one in the middle, but these one, these two would be invisible. And uh, essentially, you can think of the, the problem here is you have a unsampled area, and this is the average height is shown by this little um, yellow bar. And uh, for the narrow beam, the same thing kind of happens, except that these wedges are smaller because it's narrower. And so if you look at this picture, it's probably the best way to, to understand this. And, and essentially what we did is we used a method that somebody else had, had developed um, where you basically, what you do is you go and you estimate, you calculate how, you can calculate using geometry um, how, how big uh, these wedges are for how wide the beam is. And then uh, you can then say, okay, fine, I can do that. And then you say, okay, how many fish were there just above the seafloor where I still could see? And you basically fill in uh, the missing fish. And, and basically when you do that in this case, um, if you use the, the wide beam that we used, it, it's about almost, it's just about 7% less than the total. So we essentially just added it back in. These are the correction for the fish that we, um, that we didn't see, but essentially would have had we been using the ship. So it's a little bit of a sort of, you know, thing for people that are into sonar, but it's important because it's important to understand uh, how, you know, what the effects of, of this are. And so, you know, we thought it was about 7%, we corrected for it, and really what's left is any inaccuracies in our, in our correction. So uh, this graph here basically shows an analysis uh, comparing, uh, trying to address the issue of, well, so we did less sampling. Right, so this is this graph here. This map shows the uh, normal uh, spacing of the survey: 32 or 33 transects that are spaced at 20 nautical miles. And um, what we did is we took our previous surveys 
And then we said, fine, we'll take the even transects and the odd transects in every year, and we'll just see uh, how much uncertainties or, or you know, how, uh, you know, how essentially how much confidence we have in, in, the, in the total survey estimate if we just use half the data. And um, that's what's shown here. Um, essentially what's shown is, is in pink is, the, uh, is all the data and these other two lines are even and odd, so half the data. And this is uh, a statistical thing called CV. It's, it doesn't matter what it really is. You can think of it as an error rate. So this is 0.05 is 5%. So you sort of think you have about a 5% error rate on average over most years. Um, but if you use half the data, you basically have twice the error or, or half the confidence in the, in, in the information. So that gives us a pretty good idea of sort of where we are. It's, and, and really uh, what that means is we understand you know, how much confidence to have in this, so how much we should really believe this number when we get done with it. And we know that it's not useless. It sort of increased the, the error. Um, you can think of it from 5% to 10%, but it's not enormous. So, um, so that was also uh, uh, quite, quite reassuring. This is very similar to that biomass conversion exercise. What we've done here is just taken what we taken, you know, the, the data that we had, split it in half and saw how bad it, you know, how well or how poor it worked to try and understand what we would, would happen in a year where all we had was essentially, we actually did the odds um, in, 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 in this survey. So, so that kind of addresses all the things that we were trying to uh, put together. Um, and, and here was kind of our plan. Our plan was to essentially add one more uh, measurement um, to, to this acoustic survey. Um, and, and these are the sort of bullet points on, on what, what our approach was. We were gonna use the same methods as the survey uh, where possible, except for dealing with some of these issues that, that I just described. Um, those are really the only differences. Uh, we adjusted for the acoustic dead zone. So to account for this difference in the instruments that we use in the beam widths and the probability of detecting fish near the bottom. Um, we computed what the effect is of missing sampling. So the fewer transect problem, just like I talked about earlier. So we had this statistical model that helped us understand um, how much confidence to have in, in the results. Um, so, we, so we wouldn't be overconfident in, in the results. Um, we converted the echoes to biomass using that straight line approach that I showed. And so, and then um, the plan was to try and incorporate this into the fishery management process. So the real issue here was one of timing. Um, in the end, we had to sail the drones back. Uh, we got the data in, I think, the, maybe about the 10th of October. We had a month to sort of get everything done, get it put into the fishery management process. It's typically a process that takes uh, several months. Uh, and and the sort of we had all these differences in methodology, so it was really kind of just a scramble to kind of get everything in place um, ahead of time, so that so that when we actually had the information um, from these drones, then then we were able to uh, to process it. And an interesting point about this is that um, basically the information on these drones is coming out of a memory stick. So there's a memory stick inside that drone, and it needs to be recovered. And then you crack it open, you pull this memory stick that's been out at sea for five months out in the, you know, thousands and thousands of miles, um, you know, and you pull it out, put it in a computer, and then that's when you really start, start to work with it. So it's all about getting this, this memory stick back. So a pretty valuable memory stick, I guess, is one way to think about it. Um, the short version uh, to all this is, is that everything went really well. I mean, things really went as well as one uh, could have hoped. Um, everything worked. Here's an image of Richard recovering the drones in, mid -oct in October um, at just outside of uh, Golden Gate Bridge. Um, everything really went well. All the instruments went, went, worked well. So, um, you know, that was really great. And really, uh, he and his company kind of made this, made this all work. Um, the drones made really nice uh, sonar data. Here's some, uh, here's just another of these echograms. Now you guys all know uh, how to interpret these. Here's the seafloor, here are Pollock schools. Um, they essentially were very similar to uh, what, we, uh, what we observe on a, on a regular survey. So we didn't really have any problems or special issues related to the fact that, that these were collected on, on drones compared to ships. Uh, here's the spatial distribution of Pollock. So the uh, the color and the size is related to how much, how strong the echoes were uh, related to Pollock. You can see a lot of the Pollock 
uh, we're up here, up near uh, the Russian border. Um, it turns out that, um, you know, the, that caused issues when the Russians had their war games up here. Our drones kind of just went through the middle of them and didn't really uh, seem to, to be a problem, but that glad I sort of was worried about it at the time. Um, here is uh, the, same, the same information um, compared to other years. It's actually been put into a, into a model that kind of smooths the, the data and makes these maps. Um, I think the important point for, for those of you in the Bering Strait region, we're not really actually working in your area, but I think the important thing to see is that if you look at these maps, especially since maybe, you know, let's start at 2010, you can see that the fish were pretty concentrated out on the outer shelf um, and, and weren't really, um, and we're very low kind of out here. But if you look at this year or the last few years when the shelf has been warm, there's definitely uh, more fish, you know, out here in this area. And the bottom trawl survey has really shown that, that there's, you know, a lot, a lot more a pollock in, in the northern uh, Bering Sea. So they're kind of expanding their, uh, their, uh, their footprint in, in the Bering Sea, which is nothing new. People have known this uh, for, for quite a while. Um, so here's the uh, here's basically uh, the 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 time series. So this is year, um, and and let's focus on this green one. This is the amount of uh, backscatter, um, and you can see this is the 2020 point. So this is what we got uh, from the drone. Basically, there is an increase um, from from 2018 of about 45 percent or so. Um, so an increase that reflect, that suggests an increase in the pollock population. Um, here's what happened. Uh, when you actually do this unit conversion that, that we do, converting from echoes uh, to fish. This is our new point in this time series. It's 3.6 million uh, metric tons. That's a 40, well, just about 45% increase from 2018. So essentially it's mostly driven by the amount of echoes uh, rather than the size or other things. The other thing to notice here is that, is that these error bars are bigger. Um, this is essentially mostly because of the, uh, I don't want to get into the details of it because we get into the weeds, but this is important to understand how much confidence to have in this. And uh, these error bars are bigger uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is because of the, 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 the half transects, uh, so less sampling. And also we added uh, uncertainty due to this unit conversion because the unit conversion isn't perfect. But it turns out that these error bars are mostly bigger um, because of the, uh, because of the of the reduced sampling, so uh, so that sort of gives you a, a picture of it. Essentially, all this whole project kind of boiled down to uh, to two numbers. Um, you know what is you know what is the estimate of of total weight of fish, and, uh, and and then how much confidence to have in it. So how big this this little error bar is here. And uh, this was taken and put into the stock assessment. Um, it's been presented to. Uh, uh, several of the committees in the uh, management council process, um, the, the final quotas have not been set, but it's included in the recommend, so the information from this has been used and included in the recommendations um, that have been set in this, uh, in, in, in the quota setting process. They haven't, it hasn't, it's not official what the, what the decision is at this point. Um, this is all stuff that's just been happening, you know, in the last month or so. So that's, you know, we did all this basically for these two numbers. So this is kind of what I wanted to uh, talk about, and I'll just want to sort of hit the high point so a little bit. Um, this was basically a contingency plan in case the surveys were uh, were canceled. We kind of scrambled in April to sort of make this all happen, and and, and sort of were fortunate um, to be able to do this. Uh, things really went as well as they could have. Um, you know, that's in, that's to a great extent um, due to our previous experience having worked out all these methods beforehand, and also. Uh, Sail drone, the company that we that we chartered to to do this work, really uh, was able to do an, an amazing job and, and sort of do all of this on, on short order. Um, we launched the vehicles probably I think a week after we sort of started this project. Um, we process the data in a similar way to the surveys. That's really important because you want to make sure everything you do um, is the same, so you don't make changes in 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 your methodology that change the the survey results. Um, I think this is the, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm, I haven't found any other examples of this. I'm pretty sure this is the first use of 
information from drones that are used directly uh, to inform fisheries management and, and set fishing quotas. And, and this is you know, obviously a, a large fishery. So that was a, a good achievement, I think. Um, it is important to, to realize this doesn't do everything a ship does. You know, we didn't, for example, get length or age information, which is really important. So I had to rely uh, on, on the fishery information for that. And that's definitely a loss. Um, but, but it certainly allowed us to do something um, in a year where it proved uh, really, really difficult uh, to, to do anything else. So um, I think that's really uh, what I had. And you know, hopefully somebody will have some questions and we can talk about this a little bit. Thanks for your attention. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Alex. That was great. I learned a lot of things there. And, and for everyone, we will have questions. And we've already got one that came to me, a kind of internal chat. Um, so I know I've got questions. We'll open it up to everyone. And don't forget to put a little love in the in the um, chat box. If you hit the chat, if Alex did a good job, let him know. <laughs> I have to figure out how to turn on the chat. Hold on. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. No, that's okay. It's at the bottom bar. There's like a little pop-up bubble that says uh, oh. if you go full screen, and it'll. By say the way, chat. by the way, this was a question that came up before we have. This is yep. actually uh, where the Pollock fishery was uh, in in 2019. So this is pretty typical. So you can see this is basically hours of fishing, um, you know, and you can see it sort of, you know, right right in this area here uh, near Dutch Harbor, and then and then up near the Russian border. But it's sort of out on the shelf. Just that was a question that, that you had. No, that's that's great. And does is there some sort of regulatory line that keeps them from? Uh, I, I, mean, I know not, why they don't come past St. Lawrence Island. We have a, a research area that's that's closed for trawl fishery. Oops. Yeah, no, that's essentially is driven. Is a regulatory line or is that? No, that's no, that's driven by where the fishing is good. Um, the fishing is midwater fishing, not bottom fishing. And so the fish are in deeper right. water, the fish are higher off bottom and they're more abundant out there. Okay, well, thank you. Um, and so you got a question and that was, did you, did you all develop this plan intending to do drones only or did you do it this way because of COVID? So it sounds like because of COVID, you really put it into play, but was this anticipated to maybe switch? No, absolutely not. So, so on, you know, I don't know, I, you know, on May 15th, you know, I was going to work, my kids were going to school and there were no plans to do any of this. So this was not going to happen. So, you know, this, this sort of happened, the decision to do this kind of happened, you know, very quickly. And actually it's, it is an interesting sort of thing because, you know, people, this is an example where, you know, I, you know, government could actually do things pretty quickly. I mean, it was, it, you know, things happened really fast, you know, it was sort of a, basically just floated this idea say, Hey, we could do this. If, you know, we could sort of figure it out. We know, you know, there's something we can do and, and people kind of said, Oh yeah, you should do that. You know, and we kind of made it work. We wrote a proposal and bang, knocked on doors and, you know, got people to, to help fund it. And, uh, and, and we just did it. So no, this, that this I sort of said earlier, this whole thing was a uh, the real thing here was it uh, was sort of beating the clock so that we actually would could do this and then have it used in in the management process because you know if we'd get gotten done today it would not be useful. That's when you asked me to give this talk in you know September. I said no, <laughs> but. I hope that right, answers well, And thank you for letting us know that North Pacific Fisheries Management Council status too on, on the setting yeah. the quota from this. So it sounds like the fish went up, right? So, so the fish in this survey, the, so the fish in this survey went up. The fish, the, uh, there are other things that go into the uh, model. And so the model is down slightly. I think it's down 14%. It includes the off bottom part of the stock. It has sort of memory and it uses the, the size and age. So, so you can think of the, the model sort of reacts slowly to changes in the survey information. It's not like the, sur the quota is just set on the survey. It's set on the model and the model is it sort of likes to change slowly and um, sort of wants multiple uh, years of, of the uh, model of, of the data to change before it makes big changes. So, so the, the quota, I, it has not been set, but there are recommendations for it and they're roughly the same as last year. All right, well, we'll stay tuned for that. You have another question. Um, just curious how, people, people really like your presentation. 
Just curious, how tense were things when the drones were transiting through the Aleutians and close around the islands? And I would assume that's because of the larger ship traffic going. Yeah. Uh, so across. so it's it's a little hairy going through uh, going through Unimac. Um, you know, that's sort of one of the places that that you're worried. I mean, basically these things are really slow. They're you know go at but well, they're they're not that slow. But they you know they go two knots or something. You know, and, and so they're much slower than a than a cargo ship. You know in the middle of the night going through through Unimac. Um, that what we what we do is we kind of get the tide set right. We wait, we sat in the pass and it's like being on a sailboat. You wait till it's wind, you know, you wait till it's windy, wait till the tide's in your favor and you kind of shoot through and, and get as far as you can. Um, these things have lights on them. They have AIS, so it's basically a transponder beacon. Um, and so we have been doing this for years and haven't had any uh, issues. Um, not that you can't, um, but you know, if people are paying attention or watching the AIS, which they should be, um, then then this won't. You know, we haven't had any problems. What we do see actually is fishing boats coming up, and we, we see them in the sonar record because um, they they basically interfere. So we see the pings of so when fish fishing vessels come up, so boats will come up and look at them. I think people will run into them and you know, hey, what's that? And they'll come up and look at it, and we get photos of them from people out at sea and stuff, you know, emails with, hey, what's that? So, so Unimac is a little hairy, but, and, and I think in a related thing, this is the first time that we actually sailed them all the way up. So they were out at sea for five months. You know, that's a long time. Most of that was transit, you know? So, so really it was the whole trip was, was probably more hairy, was going, you know, that far, you know, it's, so, so that, that was really an achievement, I think. And then um, what are your plans for future drone work? That's a question in the chat. Yeah, um, so we don't have any immediate plans um, for, for, for uh, using drones in, in this way. I mean, this was really a sort of fill the gap uh, thing um, because we, we couldn't use ships. Um, we're sort of thinking about what the best ways uh, to use drones of this kind and, and other kinds to help support fisheries management and also um, to sort of do ecosystem research. I mean, the Arctic is, a, is an obvious place where um, you know, things like this are potentially useful because it's so remote and so and so far and expensive uh, to work in. You're muted, Gay. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank Matt Wilson, thank you. And also thank Matt Wilson for the shout out there. The next question comes from Vladimir Burkanov. Great job, Alex. Do you think that drones could replace ship acoustic surveys? Um, so I would have, uh, so I, I think this is, I don't know if it's replace, I would say sort of compliment. I mean, I think, um, I think, you know, this, this is probably about as close as you can get to something like that. I mean, in this case, you know, we basically filled in, you know, it's not perfect. It's not a perfect replacement, but you know, it depends on sort of what, what your goals are, um, I think it it's better to think about it more like a like a complement. And and we're actually thinking about things where you use powered drones that are fast to keep up with ships and maybe doing half the measurements so the ship does more trawling and the and the drones do uh, more acoustic mapping. You know, so they kind of work together, each one doing what they're what they're best at. So I, I think that's also a possibility in in the future. And we're sort of thinking about how to do that. You know, ships are really expensive, and so if you have a ship with a lot of people on it, you know, if you can use it more efficiently, um, that's, that's really great. And so we're thinking about ways to try and do that. You're, you're muted again, Gay, you did it again. It's my I'm trying to be helpful because we might have some noise at my house. But anyway, um, we know so little about Pollock. What is the, this is a, from the chat as well. What is the main predator of Pollock aside from humans? So, you know that that's interesting um pollock are actually cannibals so when they are which is a fun fact about pollock so when they are uh when they're small their main predator is actually themselves um so the big pollock eat the little eat the little pollock in in large amounts and so that actually is a is sort of a big deal um and then and then bottom fish like um like air tooth flounder are important are, are, are important predators uh for pollock uh, so are so are cod um, but you know, Pollock are, um, you know, I have a Norwegian friend. He talked about we, we used to work on krill, and he said, "Oh, they're the potato of the sea," you know, because Norwegians like potatoes. And and I think, um, you know, in some ways, you know, 
Pollock are kind of the potato of the seed too. You know, they're, they're really sort of very important in, in the food chain and in the bearing seed. So for in the for those of us in the Bering Strait region know that also Alex the the stellar sea lion the fifteen hundred pound stellar sea lion is also a big consumer of pollock as well yes yes and we have stellar sea lions that used to come north late summer stay at St Lawrence Island south side of St Lawrence Island St Lawrence Island has two areas of critical habitat for the stellar sea lion these are predominantly adult males that have come off the rookeries and are very hungry haven't yeah. been eating and um, want to eat. They would normally stay there. They are moving uh, north. Yeah. We up, I think uh, last mid, late November, late November, there were sea lions in the strait in number. There was yeah. about six huh. feet on fairway rock. So sent 10 miles southeast of Diomede. So that's, uh, that's a thing we've been noticing the last, last bunch of years that the sea lions are not only moving further north, but they're staying later. Yeah. Um, so, so, you I don't know, know. Po Pollock are definitely moving north. I have a couple slides if you guys want to talk about that. Um, but, you know, the bottom trawl surveys have, you know, I'll just show a couple little slides if people want, you know, because this is sort of regionally important. Um, these are just temperature maps. I think Lyle is here and can talk about them better than I can. But these are just temperature maps showing that it's gotten warmer in, in the northern Bering Sea, which is no surprise to anybody here. Um, and uh, here, here's a result from the bottom trawls survey, essentially showing these maps. So just, if you just look at these little black spots, these are Pollock that they've, that they've seen that are essentially moving north. Here's 2010 where there was very few of them when it was cold. Pollock don't like really cold water and near freezing water and it's essentially like a barrier, but once that thermal barrier sort of erodes, you know, you get a lot more Pollock. And then um, another thing that, that we've seen as part of sort of recent articles which is sort of stuff that I also work on, but it's not what we're talking about today. Um, this is a, a student I work with, uh, work Robert Levine, who would be an interesting one to give a talk here. Um, this basically shows um, that there's, uh, if you look at these bubbles, they just show the catches of little, uh, these are now small, these are teeny little things, age zero, so sort of young of the year fish. They're all small, not big, not what stellar silly lines are eating, but you know, these tiny, I took this boat of my hand because I thought it was funny that we used a giant net to catch, to catch teeny tiny fish. Um, but, but the important point here is that the blue parts of these pies are uh, Arctic cod, which is typically, you know, historically what there is in, in sort of on the Chuchi shell, um, as best we know. Um, but in 2019, the last time we, we did some survey work out there, you can see all these pies here are green and green is Pollock. And so these are baby Pollock that are probably, that have gotten infected north, so, or, or infected is just a fancy word for uh, transported or drifted north with the currents. And, um, and, you know, and this is sort of pretty surprising, you know, so there's definitely, you know, Pollock all the way you know, all the way through the, through the uh, Chechi shelf, you know, almost all the way to the Arctic, uh, to, to, to the Arctic shelf break. Um, you know, whether they survive or not, sort of what happens to them is a whole nother story. Um, the, on the Russian side of the border, there's been reports of uh, big Pollock, you know, in the Chechi, and there's actually, they opened a fishery this year. Um, and, and I don't, I think, I don't know that much about how that went or, you know, or maybe somebody on this call does, but um, so, you know, I think you're going to see more Pollock. I think that's one thing, you know, that, that I, that I think is the case. Thank you for adding those slides. That was really interesting about the Pollock that have gone through the strait and are already in the Chukchi. Yeah. Important to remember, these are teeny things. So look at this picture, right? They're not adults. Could be the you future. Know. Maybe, maybe. I mean, that definitely south of Bering Strait, you know, the, you know, there there are definitely lots of big pollock from the from the uh, bottom trawl survey. But these are probably the little guys that came from those from the adults that are south of Bering Strait. I think that's how they sort of maybe that's what happened. You know, there are a lot more adults down south that are spawning and making these. But by down south, I mean south of Bering Strait. Right. Thank you. We're certainly feeling the effects of a changing ecosystem throughout this region um, and, and to our, our neighbors to the north as well. Um, you have a couple more questions if you can handle them. Oh, yeah, um, sure. No, this is what right. I do for fun. So, yeah. um, 
you have a, a nice compliment from Kim. I'll, you should read all these when I'll- I will, yeah, once I figure out how to turn on the chat. Um, Vlad, <laughs> Vladimir Burkhanov had another question. Any problems with marine debris entanglements? And I would imagine he's asking if you saw any with your camera. Vladimir, or do you have, if you can unmute, I don't know. No, I, I mean, uh, entanglement out of drone. Yeah, yeah. Um, so oh, we, I, oh, did the drone get tangled up? Yeah. Oh, yes. Green mammals, all right. <laughs> Thank you. It's, so it's we, happen often uh, when you work on a sailboat or on a, even on yeah. Zodiac. Yeah, so we have had, so in this, this case, we haven't had a big problem. We have had problems with kelp, you know, basically coming into a big thing of kelp and you get stuck. And, and, and you actually are able to kind of back out and kind of work your way out. We've never, we've, we've also, uh, you know, and other things have been around ice and so you can have problems. But, but so with this picks up kelp, um, we've been worried about crab pots or something in the, cause there's a lot of crab, you know, pot gear and, and long lines, but uh, we haven't had any problems. Um, the biggest problems we've had is with kelp, but it hasn't been, you know, and we'll drag kelp for a while and you can actually sail backwards in this thing. So, so you kind of sail backwards and, and you get out of it. It's not, um, it's not like the Sargasso Sea or other places where, you know, there's a kilometer island of kelp that, you know, it, it's, you know, it's Bering Sea and so there's less kelp, but, but definitely have gotten stuck, but not horribly that you can't recover from. Yeah, that's great. So you have chance to drive a little bit the um, drone, so you can get and get out of that yes, pile of yes, and and the camera or whatever. And that's what the camera is actually for is is for this kind of thing. The camera is super helpful because they can um, kind of understand what's happening, you know, and 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 you know that that helps. Real, it's super important. There's four little cell phone cameras at the top. Look down, up you know, forward and back. And that's, uh, it turns out really, really important. The first drones didn't have them and they turned out, you know, it was super important for, for safety and navigation and understanding kind of what's, when something doesn't work, you know, why? You, you can often see it. And we've seen seals on them and, you know, all, all kinds of things, crazy things happening. Yeah, great job. Um, another question is, another comment with a question is, thank you for your lecture. What is the price of one robot and what's the duration and distance of autonomy? So the robots are actually not sold. They are, um, they are rented. And, and so they're rented as like a whole service. And our cost was about $2,700 a day, um, you know, was the, was the price that, that we paid. So this project was about a half million dollar project, you know, which is a lot of money, but it also, you know, it's a small amount of money compared to the uh, fishery, you know, or what's spent on a survey. So, so, you know, you can make, so that's, and the, the, uh, the autonomy, you know, is, a, is, you know, in theory, it's, you know, forever. That's not really true because you can wind up with, um, you know, marine growth, stuff like that. These, these uh, sail drones were, were, after five months, were completely fine. You know, I could have stayed out or, you know, I think they don't do a whole lot when they send them back out. They kind of clean them up a little bit and then and put them back out. So, you know, five months is how as long as that that I personally have have done this for. I mean, typically we do about 100 days, um, you know, out of Dutch Harbor. So, you know, and this was longer than that because of the transit. So we had about 60 days in the Bering Sea and, and then another 90 days of, of back and forth. Great, thank you, Alex. Great talk, Alex, and congratulations on the success. The solar panels seem small for all the electronics. This is from Rob Suryan. The, the yeah. solar panels seem small for all the, the electronics in many days of cloud cover. Are you ever power limited? Um, so are you guys, I don't know if you guys can see me. So this, is, so this is basically what runs the whole thing. We're not power limited because the, the, the way that we, I just held up my cell phone. I don't know if you can see me or not. Um, you know, essentially everything is actually really Alex. Long. You can stop sharing. Oh yeah, the stop share button. It'll oh, then make you can see your yeah, cell phone. There we go. All right. Uh, well, it's just a cell phone. You know, like so. Okay. So this is this is sort of the brains of the operation. Is basically this, right? The the trick to getting everything to work well is to 
and, and inexpensively is to harness um, developments in other fields, right? If you had to build a computer, to, a low power computer to build a, to make a drone work, it would be impossible. If you can use a cell phone chip that someone spent half a billion dollars developing to be really power efficient. Um, so everything is really power efficient. We actually did fine on power. Um, power drops off at high latitudes, but mostly, you know, come October, you know, it starts getting hairy. And so, you know, in, in Alaska in the summer, we were fine. Um, but everything is really designed to be low power. The sonar instruments, the, you know, that, that's really the way that, 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 that you can be successful. But sort of the way that we, we would have run into trouble, I think, you know, in, you know, like we couldn't do this now, you know, and would probably in the past have had issues in, you know, as you, as you start pushing into, October. Um, the other thing these vehicles have that's new is they actually have a hydro generator. So it's just a propeller that that spins. Um, and it's basically a wind generator, except you're sailing and then it, you know, you drag this propeller through the water. And when they move fast, that also has, has actually helped. But but it's really about keeping power consumption low is the is the way to be successful, not to add uh, not to add a lot of solar panels. Awesome. And um, from Fletcher Saywall, thanks for the great talk, for a great talk. Any thoughts on trying to fit a sail drone with a high resolution side scan sonar or Didson to get fish images to measure sizes, maybe when they come up at night? Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting idea, um, especially the side scan thing. You know, I've oh, always Fletcher. wanted to do something like that. I haven't. Um, there are, um, there are sort of these new, uh, you know, side sense, you know, sort of sonars that you can get, like you get for your sport fishing boat, you know, kind of thing that would be sort of interesting to, uh, to play around with. I mean, um, measuring size is something that's, you know, relatively difficult using acoustics. There's a couple of approaches that, that one could try. Um, the other thing you can do is just look at the, find echoes from single fish and um, just look at how strong they are using the same equipment. Um, that's something we've done in other places, but wasn't something we could do sort of in this project because we were trying to get it done and not, you know, figure out new ways to do things. But, you know, that's kind of what I do for fun. So, but that's a great idea. And I think, I think that was it. I, I did say to Alex earlier, if, the, if he does come to the Northern Bering Sea, you know, we had Bart Bessler with the NOAA Corps send a sail drone or a series of sail drones, I don't know how many, and hopefully we'll hear from him um, in a few, a month or two, um, up into the Beaufort Sea. And the comments when he was talking to the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commissioners at the meeting, they wanted to make sure in this region that there was an, the commissioners from the Bering Strait region wanted to make sure there was a big American flag painted on uh, the <laughs> sail drone. And, and it, it is probably pretty funny, but when you live in the border, um, yeah. we do have, and this summer was a little bit more tense with um, military issues, both locally yeah. and then of course some that were really got a lot more media attention, but locally here we had a lot more um, yeah. both in the air and, and but right at the border and we're transboundary. So know that that's, um, I'm glad you'll be taking that back. Yeah. And my, my, yeah, and my question was, um, do you share this with the Russians? Can you share this technology or, or do you have, or is that something you're not allowed to do because you're federal? federal? Well, I mean, this but is- I would think fishery to fishermen they, or biologist to biologist or whatever, they'd be so yeah. interested yeah. in- so, so when we do our ship-based surveys, we actually have collaboration with the Russians. They often come on our ship. Um, they have for years. And so we actually bring Russians along and we give them a copy of the data. Um, and we actually also, when we do the ship surveys, we apply to go for permission to go into Russia. And we actually um, survey in Russian waters. Um, and, we, and, and we do that periodically. Um, in the last few times we've tried to do that, uh, we have not been successful, um, you know, basically related to, to sort of international relations, but we apply to the State Department, who then applies to, to, to uh, the Russian government for us to do that. Um, so, so we do uh, work closely with the Russians um, and, and, you know, have, have been over the line, you know, many times. So then we, and we keep, awesome. keep doing that. Um, 
We also have a different project that we're doing um, that is that is a series of moorings that basically have similar sonars as we're on the sail drones that we actually put um, near the line to try and estimate how many fish are migrating across because that's important. You know, the way they're managed is you basically assume the fish don't swim across the border, which of course they do. And um, especially as it's gotten warmer, they probably, you know, have changed their behavior. So we're trying to understand that, but that's for another day. But yeah, well, that will hold you to that. Um, and then for me personally, my last question is, um, you showed the underwater footage with some complicated stuff on the stern there, <laughs> to deal with the pitch and yaw, right? Yeah. Of the of the thing, is that gimbaled or is that electronically so it's, it's so sort of trying to level it out? It's really simple. What it is, so so it's a sailboat, right? And and sailboats, when it's windy, they tilt, right? Because they have a sail, sure. right? And so um, all it is was designed by a, a friend of mine, and, and uh, who I, I sort of um, essentially what it is is it's imagine a door hinge. So it's a it's essentially a hinge and a big chunk of lead, and so you know it's gravity. So basically, it just it basically doesn't take the pitch out, but it takes the roll because you know a, a sailboats they're mostly tilted to one side or the other, and so it's just a like a hinge. Like imagine just a door hinge with a big you know chunk of lead on it, and so it just wants it just wants to sink and point straight down because of gravity, and so it keeps the transducer pointed down and the. The pitch motions are kind of small, and so they don't really matter. The thing that really kills you in making these measurements is is not pointing straight down, and and so this actually really helps it. We put accelerometers on it and sort of tested it, and all that all sort of worked out uh, really really well. And and the, a lot of the complicated stuff you saw was actually um to limit cable fatigue because what happens is there's the cable that goes up to the electronics, and if it bends bends back and forth bends back and forth, it'll actually snap you know, right. eventually. And so I don't know if you guys ever, as you know, for your kids or something, I've ever seen those snakes that are like plastic snakes that are interlocking. Anyways, it's like a bunch of interlocking little bits of plastic that base called a, I've learned this, it's called a bend, uh, it's called a bend radius limiter. And it's basically like a bunch of little plastic things that don't allow it to bend into a too tight a bend. And that has proved, you know, cause it's just wiggling back and forth millions and millions of times, but, right. but has sort of solved that problem. So, you know, engineers are smart and if you explain to them what you need, they can get there. So, and um, <laughs> somebody wrote in the chat to me. Um, they actually had one of those snakes, and it scared the heck out of them. As yeah, much. there you go. <laughs> okay, it wasn't. So there you go. Totally Very good. Animal. Good descriptor. Um, <laughs> and actually, um, we did have a comment that said for the the tension remark that I made um, that the U.S. Coast Guard, and this is for the Pollock, uh, the the incident with yeah. the Pollock yeah. fleet. That the U.S. Coast Guard actually failed uh, its citizenry and did not adequately inform the U.S. fleet. That was the real tension, and that actually is uh, that is correct. They did inform. Um, they did do the proper informing yeah. to the federal government. You know, could we all communicate more? Heck yeah! But they yeah. did do the minimum that was required, and the translation of that message was not widely disseminated. And so there was a lot of confusion and um, confusion. Yes, it's a, I mean, example I, I, of not enough communications. And so yeah. we, we hate to see that, um, especially here. And uh, so anyway, that is correct statement. So the Russians did actually in that situation do what they should have done. Yeah, I, I did speak that. with, yeah, I did speak out, you know, the fishing industry obviously was interested in the sort of what the hell are you doing? Drones oh, I'm sure from, they yeah. were just a, and they, and it was very yeah. shocking and surprising. Yeah. And the Coast Guard did not at that time have uh, in, timely information to yeah. give back. Yeah, they, they were done very quickly, shocked. and they were, were able. Shocked, you know, that, and it turned out they had finally sort of gotten to good fishing and sort of right in that in that area by the north. And 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 they, you know, for them it was a complete surprise. Right, you know, and it won't that. happen. I'm sure it won't happen again, um, yeah. anytime soon. So that that was that. So with that, thank you so much. Okay, okay. Oh. can I jump in for just yes. a, a real quick question? Alex, you mentioned the uh, sailboat. Um, uh, and it, it just got me thinking that uh, my experience is that when you're out sailing, you're really, uh, to a large extent, at the mercy of wind direction. And I'm wondering if yes. it seems pretty fortuitous that you were able to keep the orientation of the transects. Were, were, were those made up of a bunch of little tacks or were you able yes. to? Yes, it's a sailboat. Right, so sailboats can't sail upwind. You're right, Matt. I mean, I know Matt that you sail. I sail for fun too. And um, and uh, and uh, 
they basically just tack back and forth. You see, you give them a corridor. So you just tell it like, you know, go up when it just knows I want to go over there. And it, and it basically, and then you tell it, don't deviate more than, you know, we give it, usually give it a half a kilometer corridor. So I want you to head this direction. They actually go in a completely straight line if it's, you know, if they're not going upwind. And as soon as they get to 30 or 40 degrees of the wind, they just tack. And you can just, you can actually control the, you know, how, you know, how tight that tack is by just changing this thing. And it does it all automatically. I mean, you know, I guess if you and I are smart enough to, to sail a boat, then, you know, you can probably have a computer do it, you know. So, so would there would there have been a, in terms of the transit or Wilson, speed or whatever? You know, would there have been a better a better a more efficient orientation of the transects just in terms of the sail yeah. aspect? No. So we we looked at that, you know, and thought about it and plot and like looked at wind directions, and it's actually all over the place. So in the summertime, it's just like you can't. We sort of thought about that. Said, hey, is there a better way to do this? And 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 it actually is the, uh, makes almost no difference because the winds are light and variable and 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 sort of you know, it, they shift and it's really squirrely. And so there's no like preferred way from a sailing perspective. That's obviously not the case, you know, other places. If, if you actually saw our, um, our, you know, how we sailed north, you know, we, there, there we actually used sort of sailboat routing. And so we didn't go in a straight line on the way there. We actually sailed out into the Pacific where to get basically for it to be windier. So it was further, but, you know, it's just basic sailing stuff, you know, like, can't get there from here kind of thing. Nice. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Alex. Sure. Top Good speed? To Top speed? Um, I think eight knots. And I think these things have gone um, in the, I know in the Southern Ocean, they go really fast. I can't remember and I don't want to tell you how fast, but but ridiculously fast. You Big know, but swells. That, I'm sure they're running down those. Super windy, you know, yeah. you know, it doesn't always end well. So. <laughs> You know. oh, yeah, I bet. All right. Well, thank you so much. And um, we better let everybody go home. If there's no other questions, we'll consider this. If, if you want to stay on, I'm going to turn off the recording. Sure.